working with but in this week's seminar we have a pleasure to host Vata Ziavin from um, ICQ as a PhD student of uh, Annabelle and Sands, who's a group leader there. Uh, and Beata specializes, I guess, in her PhD in uh, questions of uh, that concern causality in, in quantum mechanics. Although in the past, uh, in the like in her master, okay, before being a PhD student, she was working, I guess, in astrophysics, optical clocks, some uh, like some like broader quantum physics, right? Before you switch to foundations. Yeah, that's know. right. Okay, but today she'll be uh, telling us about uh, uh, DAGs and hidden variables. So the screen is yours. Thanks for uh, accepting the invitation. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, so today I'll try to answer the question, how to study causal models with unobserved variables. And I guess you can already uh, guess the answer from my title, and it's using inequality constraints. So this is why I'll be talking about inequality constraints in directed acyclic graphs with hidden variables. Uh, so uh, as Michal said, I'm currently a PhD student at ICQ2T, but before that I worked at Perimetry Institute, and the work that I will present you today I did there with, uh, in Canada in collaboration with Noam Finkelstein, Ellie Wolf, Elia Spitzer, and Robert Speckens. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with some basic introduction to causal inference to make sure everyone is on the same page. And then I'll go to uh, the main results and I'll discuss two different papers. So two different uh, kind of results, but they will both concern uh, the question how we can learn from inequality constraints. And uh, at the end, as I promised in my abstract, I'll try to discuss the relation between causal inference and quantum foundations. Okay, so as we'll be talking about causal models today, uh, what is a causal structure? We use Bayesian networks to represent a causal influence in a system. So in a Bayesian network, we have uh, nodes that correspond to variables. Here we, ha we have X and Y, and you have arrows that correspond to causal re relations. So for example, here, uh, this diagram basically means that uh, X influences Y. And these two graphs here represent the same probabilistic model, but different causal models. So this is really the beauty of causal models that we do not only have a probability distribution over variables in the model, but we also have a causal structure. So we know what is the underlying, uh, what are the underlying causal influences between the variables. Sorry, just a question. Uh, yeah. uh, probabilist, by probabilistic model, you mean uh, uh, global, like, Joint probability distribution yeah. of variables. Okay, yes. thanks. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so we have a joint probability distribution, but then if we have a, if we know the causal structure as well, uh, then we have some constraints due to the structure. So, for example, in the uh, graph that you can see here, you'll have that W and Y are independent given X, because you can see that all influence from W to Y goes through X. And this kind of constraints impose equality constraints on the observed distribution. So uh, in this case, it's a conditional, conditional independence constraint given here. Uh, okay, and we can use these kinds of constraints to learn about the uh, true causal structure. So what I mean that by that is that if we have a probability distribution over some variables, and this conditional independence is not pres uh, present in the observed data, then this causal structure must be incorrect. So we can use equality constraints to learn about the underlying causal structure of the model. Okay, so to uh, I'll introduce some concepts from causal inference so we can uh, understand the results better. So the basic structure that appears in graphs are uh, forks. So here we have Z that is a common cause of X and Y, or we also say that Z is a parent of X and Y. We also have colliders. So here Z is just a child of X and Y, and we have chains like this one. And we say that a path between X and Y is blocked by a node Z if one of the following holds. So if we have a fork structure like this one, the path is blocked uh, if the middle vertex is Z. 
So here Z blocks the path between X and Y. If we have the chain, so like here, uh, is the same. So if Z is in the middle, it means that the block blocks a path between X and Y. And uh, in a collider, um, a path is blocked by a node Z uh, uh, if neither the middle vertex nor any of its descendants is Z. Um, so as you can see, the notion of blocking a path is pretty intuitive. So for example, here, our information from X to Y passes through Z. So it makes sense that Z blocks a path, while in a collider, this is not really a case. And now we can formalize it by a notion of the separation. Uh, so let X and, and uh, X, Y, and Z be different sets of variables represented in a DAG. And we say that X and Y are deseparated by Z if and only if Z blocks all paths between X and Y. So first of all, you can see that I generalized this definition from having single variables to having sets of variables. And we just talk about the blocking a path between the sets of variables. Uh, and the second thing that you can see here is that this uh, criterion can be simply read off uh, from a graph. So if we have a directed, directed ICT graph, we can just read off from it which uh, variables are deseparated. And why is it useful? Mm. Oh, before I say why is it useful, I have an example here. So for example, here, you uh, is in the middle, so it blocks the path between X and Y. So here we say that you deseparate X and Y. But here you can see that we have an additional path from X to Y as this directed edge. So in this case, you uh, does not deseparate X and Y. And the notion of deseparation captures conditional independence relations in DAX. So in this case, X and Y are conditionally independent given you, and here, this is not the case. Uh, so this just formalizes how we can uh, use a graphical criterion that we apply to a graph to read off a conditional independence relation that should apply to the probability distribution that describes the variables. Oh, can, I, can I ask, so is it the case that yes. if some variables deseparate, some collection of variables deseparates de uh, X and Y, then uh, then you have this conditional independent, so let's say X, uh, is condition like when you consider conditional probability distribution of let's say x given y and z, then it doesn't depend on uh, x on on y. Sorry, yeah. On you. So for example, here we have x, y, and u, and the probability distribution of x and y given u equals to the probability distribution of x given u times the probability distribution of y. Okay. Given okay. U. So yeah, it just factorizes basically. Mm, okay, so mm, in this example here, I only talked about observed variables really. So let me now introduce the concept of unobserved variables. So for this presentation, I'll denote unobserved variables with red nodes and they will have outgoing red arrows like here. And if we have an unobserved variable in a model, it means that we know that this variable exists in the model. We know that it influences our observed variables, but we cannot observe either uh, its values. So we also don't know its probability distribution. So although this is still the case that here you deseparate X and Y, well, it's not very useful because we cannot condition uh, on the value of U because we cannot observe U. So this is a big problem in causal inference is that very often we will have unobserved variables uh, and because of them, we will have fewer inequality constraint, uh, equality constraints. Mm. Okay, so like I just said, we'll just have fewer equality constraints that appear in the data because although the deseparation relations are still there, we cannot test them because we do not observe the value of you. Okay, so how can we deal with that? Uh, in this presentation, I want to show you that if we have few or we don't have equality constraints, we can learn from inequality constraints. Uh, and I will start with a restricted cardinality approach to this problem. So what do I mean by restricted cardinality? Uh, as I said, we will talk about uh, graphs with unobserved variables, but now in this particular approach, uh, I want to add one assumption, and it's that the unobserved variable has known cardinality. So I'll denote cardinality like this. And this basically means that 
uh, U.S. cardinality too, so it can only take two different values. So now, although U is unobserved, we know it's cardinality. Okay, so how can we use it? Uh, in order to show you the main result, let me introduce this concept first of non-negative factorization. So let P be a non-negative matrix. Then the non-negative rank of P is the smallest number R for which P can be decomposed into a positive sum over R non-negative rank one matrices. So maybe this form of the non-negative, that this definition is more uh, straightforward. As you can see, the non-negative rank, I'll denote it like this, is just the minimum number R such that we can decompose P like this. And although this decomposition is not, like when you look at it, it's not maybe straightforward that it's uh, it connects to conditional independence, but this can be written such that it can be related to saying that uh, to basically, yeah, to conditional independence. Uh, sorry, I'm like, as I said, I maybe didn't see very well today, but I'm, I kind of, I don't see the correspondence between between what is written and the formula. <laughs> okay, so, so is the smallest number R, so is the minimum R for which P, and P is a non-negative matrix, here I just called it P X Y, mm -hmm. sure. can be decomposed, so here we have the composition, uh, into a positive sum over R, uh, so we have a sum from one to R, non-negative yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank-Pan matrices. Where... Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> this is the point when I'm kind of lost uh, in a sense that like this star, uh, this P over there, right? It's this. Uh, hmm? In what sense it's rank? I mean, I understand how to write it. Like, what would be okay? Like, if, how to put it? Uh, like, uh, like it, it, it's not rank one explicitly in some sense or. Yeah. What do you mean? Like it's a um, like this. Needs it's a bit weird notation. Just I, I'm, I'm confused by it. Oh, okay. Uh, like, because like okay. I would just write like cat bra or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I see right. what you mean. So, yeah, so I think how to read? Like, how should I? Because like I, I guess you're using this notation, and I want to kind of understand like what's the into what's the intuition behind like because if i saw such an expression without the sum and without okay i'm just talking about myself but i guess like uh, like if i saw that such a product of matrices sorry these are this vectors. Is like a vector right? yeah like, and this is why it's rank one so i didn't yeah i guess it will be clear on the next slide okay but, but this is why people find like people write transpose or something to make sure fine okay yeah. okay uh, okay, so it can be actually shown that the non-negative rank uh, can be treated as a measure of dependence in a probability distribution. So if we represent, like it's a pretty trivial observation that we can represent every uh, probability distribution as a non-negative matrix. And this is why on the previous slide, I had these like two ind uh, indices here. And then if X and Y are independent, so we have this probability distribution over X and Y, but there are independent variables, then of course this probability distribution will factorize, right? And then uh, it has non-negative rank one. So yeah, hence the notation in the previous slide, but I understand that maybe it was not so clear. Um, okay, so if they're independent, the non-negative rank of this probability distribution is one. But as the correlation as, or dependence between X and Y increases, so does the non-negative rank of the distribution. So basically higher the non-negative rank, higher the correlation between X and Y. And uh, this could be formalized uh, in such a way that we could connect the definition between a non-negative rank and conditional independence, but it's quite a technical step. And basically the corollary of it is the following, it's that, the non-negative rank uh, of the matrix uh, that <clears throat> describes the probability distribution over variables X and Y constitutes a lower band for the cardinality of a variable Z that D separates X and Y. So as you can see on a previous slide, I talked about conditional independence, but I also introduced this notion of D separation that is just like a graphical criterion that we apply uh, to a graph to read off conditional independence relations. So if we connect all of these things together, this is where this corollary comes from. Mm. 
And yeah, if you cannot see how we can use it now, I'll just show some applications. But uh, well, what's important here is that, as you can see here, we have three variables, x, y, and z. Z deseparates x and y. So for example, it's a common cause of x and y. And the only thing that appears in this equation is the cardinality of z. So z could be an unobserved variable. And then if we add uh, our assumption about restricted cardinality so that we know the cardinality of z, then we can use this inequality constraint to learn something uh, about the true causal structure of a model. OK, so let me show you an example. So this one is uh, about witnessing causal influence. So assume that we have the following model. We have two events, two observed events, x and y, and they both have cardinality free, so three possible outcomes each. And we also have an unobserved common cause with cardinality two. And now we make a causal hypothesis. So we say that we have these three events and the causal structure uh, between these three events is either this one or this one. So as you can see in this one, there is no direct causal influence from X and y, uh, to Y, but on this one, we have this arrow here. So this is why this example is called mid-tensing causal influence, because, well, we have two observed variables, one unobserved one. The only, know, uh, the only thing that we know about it is its cardinality. And now we want to ask a question, given a probability distribution, uh, can we say, whether there is a direct causal influence from X to Y. And actually, yes, we can say whether it's true or not because we can use our corollary. So if the cardinality of uh, X and Y is free, uh, it will be possible that the non-negative rank of the probability distribution will be equal to three. So if it would be the case, then this constraint would not be satisfied because we know that the cardinality of the common cause is two, and then it would be impossible for this causal structure to uh, describe our probability distribution. And in such a case, uh, we could conclude that there is a direct causal influence from X to Y. Okay, so sorry about that, because I'm still bug. I mean, I understand sort of conceptually everything that you are saying, and it's kind of nice, like model, like how you actually compute this uh, rank. But can you just go back to the definition? I just want to understand to, to ask if I understand okay. well the definition. So can I just okay? I'm okay. I'm confused by this rank one matrices, but like to turn it the other way. Kind of around like looking at the applications that you show later and uh, connecting to independence. Can I uh, can I view this non-negative rank as a minimal number of you know you decompose your probability distribution as product probability as a convex combination of product probability distributions and then you are wondering what is the minimal number of those product independent. Uh, probability distributions that you need to like have to uh, to realize a given pr uh, probability is that the yeah, right? so this will the non-negative rank will be this minimal number okay so, so that i understand because like you know we we are like uh, at least i am like doing this quantum mechanics all the time and i can like sure uh rank you know like because like when i uh, look at this definition just it's like okay it's nothing else than like a rank of a matrix of positive uh, semi-definite matrix in some sense, right? But okay, there is this underlying sort of assumption that it's like a bipartite, like joint probability distribution of, that this matrix represents probability distribution of two variables and yeah. Like, so okay. I wouldn't say it's like an underlying assumption uh, because the non-negative rank of a matrix is like used in different contexts than like okay. probability distributions, but like this is what allowed us to derive this result is like to connect non-negative rank like to a probability distribution and then to conditional independence because then we can link it to the separation and like to graphs. So it's not really an under yeah, but I think it's like nice to understand it, especially yeah, okay. Uh, but with like, this, me, like sorry, I'm sure. like so uh... okay, I'm being picky, but when you have a matrix and you ask what is the number the minimal number of are non-negative rank one matrices that that are sort of needed. Okay, fine. No, okay, I I shut up. Sorry, please. It's it's very interesting what you're saying. I... Okay. 
Yeah, like if you have any questions, like if anyone has any questions, just interrupt me. Um, okay, so yeah, I showed you this first application. And although it's a very easy one, I think it's a very nice one because it's actually a big problem in causal inference if you have unobserved variables to see uh, whether your observed variables actually uh, exhibit any direct causal influence or maybe it's the case that you know the correlations that you're observing are only due to a common cause. Okay, so the next application that I have uh, is about distribution generation. So it's a problem that's considered in communication theory mostly, and it goes as follows. So suppose that we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they're responsible for generating random variables, X and Y respectively, such that X and Y have a pre-specified joint distribution. And now the question is, how much information must be communicated or shared to generate this probability distribution? So when people consider this problem in uh, communication theory, as I said, they usually separate it into these two scenarios. So the first one is uh, how much, here the question would be how much information must be shared to generate X and Y if Alice and Bob cannot communicate. So then this uh, minimum number of bits that needs to be uh, yeah, that needs to be shared between Alice and Bob uh, is called randomized correlation complexity. Uh, but as you can see, it's pretty straightforward that uh, if Alice and Bob cannot communicate and the bits are just sent to them, we can represent this scenario with this causal structure. And now when we are asking, uh, when we are like, allowing Alice and Bob to communicate, but they cannot share any randomness. Uh, then we ask uh, how many bits Alice needs to send to Bob in order to generate this pre-specified probability distribution. And now uh, this number is usually referred to as randomized communication complexity. But again, it's pretty straightforward that this is the causal graph that corresponds to this scenario. So. This problem was like solved previously in the literature, but like if you would look at the solution, it's not very straightforward. It needs like a lot of matrix manipulation, like some tricks. But uh, now you can see that using our corollary, the answer to this question is pretty straightforward because both in this case and in this case, that D separates X and Y. So we can put a bound on the cardinality of Z. So the number of bits that needs to be shared uh, or communicated uh, in order to generate this probability distribution. So I find this example nice for two reasons. First of all, because like it's very like quick and easy to get a solution to this problem. And second of all, it connects these two problems together. So usually uh, they're studied separately and people don't really connect this uh, common cost scenario with this communication scenario. But from here, you can see that it's just a de-separating variable and that de-separates X and Y. OK, so maybe before I'm sorry I go. About that, so, yeah. uh, so uh, OK, just uh, yeah, one, <laughs> two more questions. So mm -hmm. uh, those, those bounds, so are they uh, tied uh, or like, like, is it OK? So you know that you need this many like this much communication, but can you like, do you have some converse bound or bound from above on the Z? I think it depends on the probability distribution. Does it make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, because... Uh... So, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I... okay, just maybe, uh, okay, it's, it's good to know that maybe it's uh, you need at, at at least I don't know five bits of uh, communication to share, but maybe actually what you uh, need is like five hundred bits, right? So that's yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah so um, yeah, that's a, yeah. Of course, that's a good question, and I think the answer depends. Like there are some upper bounds for sure. But I think it depends on the structure of the probability distribution, mm -hmm. basically. OK, another question is this this interesting rank that I'm so passionate about. So is it, <laughs> no, I'm laughing. Uh, like, uh, is it kind of, given a matrix, is it efficient to, to compute it? Depends on the size of the matrix. So uh, yeah, so 
when I was like studying the non-negative rank, I discovered that it's actually used in a lot of scientific disciplines. So people use it in like sound processing and in some branches of astronomy. So like there exists algorithm to compute it, but I think it's uh, like approximate algorithm. So if, like depending on what kind of approximation you would be satisfied with, there exists algorithm that you can use. And mm -hmm. I know there that they are good enough that people use them in some branches of science. So. Uh, sure, thanks. Yeah, but like if you have a big matrix, then like to do it exactly, then it's not an easy task. Okay, so do you have any more questions about this restricted cardinality approach before I go to the kind of next section of the talk? Okay. Uh, so just to summarize, we just discussed how to study uh, causal models with unobserved variables uh, using the assumption uh, about restricted cardinality. Okay, and now I'll be keep talking about uh, inequality constraints, but now I'll focus on a totally different uh, approach. So now we forget that we have this additional assumption, we don't have it anymore, and we'll take an information theoretic approach to this problem. Okay, so we are back to the slide uh, that we have unobserved variables. And because of this, in many models, we'll have less equality constraints that appear in the data. So for example, let's take this model. That's, it's usually referred to as instrumental scenario. And in this particular case, there are no equality constraints on observed data distribution. However, there are inequality constraints and there are entropic inequality constraints. So for example, we know that uh, the mutual information between A and B and C must be lower or equal to the entropy of B in this case, uh, where, oh, sorry, where the entropy and the mutual information are defined as here. So if you look at the literature, you will find that for some specific graphs that are like really popular and people studied, there will be some inequality constraints derive like specifically for these graphs. But the question that I want to ask now is where does this inequality constraint come from? And maybe can we generalize this method of deriving entropy inequality constraint, constraint such that it will apply to arbitrary graphs? Okay, so as you can see in this diagram here, all the information that goes from A to C must go through B, right? So I'll call set of variables bottlenecks. So I'll say that B is a bottleneck between A and C because all the information goes through B. Formally, bottlenecks are captured in the graphical criterion known as E separation. And it's related to this separation. And I will give you a formal definition a little bit later. Uh, but now I want to ask, can we extend this intuition to arbitrary graphs? So this intuition that whenever we have a bottleneck, we can get an uh, entropic inequality constraints. So a fun example that I have here is that example that Amy wants to send some information to Cathy, but she can only do it through Bob. So Bob is the bottleneck and all the information goes through him. So let's say that Amy sends some information to Bob. And now let's say that, that Bob only ever sends the same uh, one message regardless of what he gets from Amy. And then, of course, Katy can't find anything out about Amy's node from Bob, right? So this is why we talk about entropy, because in this case, Bob's nodes have zero entropy, denoted like this, and he cannot convey any information to Katy. But now, as the entropy of Bob's node increases, so there's variety in his nodes, there is also the potential uh, for Katy to learn about Amy's node from both, uh, Bob's node increases. But it's only a potential, there are no guarantees, because Bob may be just sending Gatti nonsense. And this is why we have an inequality constraint and not an uh, equality constraint, because the information shared between, uh, between Amy and Gatti uh, is just bonded from above by the entropy of Bob's nodes. So again, this is just mutual information, and this is the entropy. So it's just a simple intuition about passing information. And this is why we would call Bob a bottleneck because the amount of information that can get for a bottleneck cannot exceed its entropy. Okay, so formally these bottlenecks are captured by the 
graphical criterion known as E separation. So let A, B, C, and D be disjoint sets of variables represented uh, in a diagram. And then A and B are said to be E separated by C after deletion of D if A and B are D separated by C after deletion of every variable in D. So in this case, D would be a bottleneck. And although it's a pretty long definition, you can see that it's related to D separation. And in this example, we're also allowing for uh, deletion, of, like we can delete a variable from a graph. So we can basically just take it out. And now this is very convenient because, well, what if we have a D separating variable that it's unobserved? Well, we cannot really condition on its value. But it might be the case that we can take it out from the graph and then we will have some D separation relations, which basically means that we have some E separation relations in a graph. Uh, yeah, and then we can basically read off some inequality constraints uh, from this E separation relations. So formally, uh, oh, this only works if the variables in D are discrete. So then our bottleneck needs to have discrete variables. Uh, and whenever A and B are E separated by C after deletion of D, then this inequality holds. So you can see that we have a relation between the mutual information between A and B and the entropy of the bottleneck. Uh, now, this is the most general inequality constraint that you can write down. But if you're interested in this sort of stuff, like adding additional assumptions uh, to, uh, to our diagram, basically, you can get a bunch of different inequalities just from this one. Okay, so we have this inequality constraint and how can we use it? So for example, we can use it to this. So, but I just wanted to clarify. So this yeah. e separation, because I, I guess this separation is something that ex ex exists in this causality literature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but this e separation, is it something that you guys introduced and no. you proved uh, the, this inequality? That, that it follows that you have those entropic inequalities or it existed and then you proved uh, that like it existed and then we proved that so oh. yeah so something that uh, like a e separation existed and it was known that whenever there is an e separation relation in a graph there should be some inequality constraint on the data, but people didn't know how to like derive this inequality constraints. So we derived this inequality constraint that I give here, but also a bunch of like different inequality constraints that you can derive from this one using the additional assumptions. And like, so for example, the one for the instrumental scenario. So um, originally like it was derived using a different method, but you can just easily derive it by reading off the separation relations and using this theorem. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. But uh, again, a different application is deciding between causal structures. And although this might seem uh, very similar to the case when I was discussing witnessing uh, causal influence, actually, when we were talking about witnessing causal influence, we had two diagrams. And in one, we had a de separation relation that we didn't have in the other one. and these separation relations are like it's usually hard to find them in the diagrams. Like if you have a very complicated diagram, it is more likely that you will have e separation relations rather than a d separation relation. So I would say that like this inequality constraint is like maybe not more useful, but most of the times, if you want to test your true causal model, you would find yourself using this one because you have some e separation relations. Okay, so let's say that we have some probability distribution over all of these observed variables. And we know that it's uh, the underlying causal model is either this one or this one. So as you can see, the only difference uh, is this direct causal influence from Z to Y that is here, but we do not have it here. And actually this is a pretty complicated problem because these two structures impose the same conditional independence constraints which means that like in both of these diagrams, the deseparation relations are the same. But thankfully we have additional entropic inequality constraints in the graph on the left. So if we look at it closely here on the left, C is an information bottleneck between Z and Y conditional on A. 
So equivalently, Z and Y are E separated by A upon dilating C. And we can use a stronger version of the inequality constraint of the theorem that I showed you. And from there, we can derive this, uh, this inequality constraint. So again, you can see that although we have three unobserved common causes here, which is, I would say, a lot, because you can see that we have like a lot of correlations in these three variables that will be generated, not by like Z and these arrows, but they can be generated just by the unobserved common causes. We can uh, derive an inequality constraint that only takes in observed variables, and this is how we can test the model. Mm -hmm. And the second one that uh, is true for this graph, but is not true for this graph, is that M is an information bottleneck between Z and A and Y. And here you can see that I didn't say conditional on anything, because here it's like conditional on an empty set. So um, this, our theorem also works if like any of the variables is an empty set, and then still you can have e-separation relations. Okay. So yeah, just to summarize uh, everything that I just said, we presented graphical criterions for obtaining testable inequality constraints on observed data. And this is very nice because it works on uh, graphs with unobserved variables when we do not sometimes have equality constraints, but as I showed, these inequality constraints are also pretty good for uh, learning about the true causal model. Okay, so before I go further, are there any questions? Okay, so now let's talk about quantum causality. So, well, as you probably know, the uh, all the framework of classical causal modeling do not apply to quantum theory. So there is this big question whether we should even look for something like quantum causality, so like uh, for some principles of causal modeling that would describe uh, influences between quantum systems, and is it related to classical causality, or is it maybe something totally different? So if you want to answer this question, I think there are like two main approaches that you can take. Uh, okay, but before I'll talk about it, I just wanted to kind of recommend and discuss this one paper. So as you can see, it's called The Lesson of Causal Discovery, Algorithm for Quantum Correlations. Causal explanation of Bell inequality relations require fine tuning. And it's by Christopher Wood and Robert Speckens. So when I said that, the, uh, that quantum systems like do not really follow the, um, the rules of classical causal influence, well, it probably makes sense to all of you, but this paper is like it does a really good job of formally studying uh, this model, and it gives a few good arguments that this is the underlying uh, causal structure of Bell scenario if if it would only had uh, classical variables. So as you can see, we have this common cause, or people uh, usually refer to it as a hidden variable that's shared between Alice and Bob. And then additionally, we have settings on Alice's side and settings on Bob's side that influence their outcomes. And in this paper, Christopher Wood and Robert Speckens argue that this is the causal structure that should describe the Bell scenario. So there shouldn't be any signaling or any retrocausation. Um, and also what they show is that it's impossible to explain Bell inequality violations using a classical causal model without fine tuning. So maybe let me just say what is fine tuning. As fine tuning is basically a way of changing the parameters that maybe for each value of lambda, we will have some signaling uh, between here and here, but as long as we, like it goes away when we average over lambda. So fine tuning is basically allowing for some, let's say non, intuitive explanations of our correlations for each lambda as long as it averages out at the end. Okay, so this is what this paper is showing. And well, like we kind of all knew about it, but it's also pretty weird, right? Like Judah Appel, he's like the father of causality and he derived more of the, most of the results in causal inference. He 
he called the causal models and causal influences the building blocks of the universe and of the theories that we know. So like quite obviously something is missing here, right? Because we're missing the, if we could paraphrase his words, we're missing the building blocks of quantum theory because we don't really know why we have this uh, Bell inequality violations uh, and what is the causal model that could possibly explain them. Okay, so the question is how to learn something about the quantum world using classical uh, causal inference, because it is possible. And I would say there are two main approaches in the literature. And the first one is to look at generalizations of classical concepts to quantum formalism. So this usually results from attempts to describe causality in quantum systems. So people just uh, take a quantum system that's kind of a generalization of a classical one and then try to generalize the rules of classical causal inference to quantum causal inference. And I'm sorry that I don't have references here, but there are a bunch of examples when people did that. So for example, there's the quantum Rayshon Bax principle, quantum bias theorem, or quantum randomized trial. But these are just like simple, it's like one block each. So they're not very connected, it's just people take one phenomena and try to generalize it. Now, the second approach is further investigation of classical causal models because it helps to realize the difference between the classical and quantum worlds. So this is, for example, what, what sorry, uh, wrong side, okay. So this is, uh, for example, of Christopher and Robert that like in most of this paper, they just study classical causal inference, but just by studying classical causal models, you can really learn a lot about quantum models when you look at, uh, at this inequality violations. Okay. So now let's see, can we take this first approach here and the restricted cardinality constraint that I presented to you at the beginning, and can we try to generalize it to the quantum formalism to learn something about uh, causality in a quantum world? Okay, so this, this was our example. Um, so the causal hypo hypothesis was either this one or this one, right? Mm, okay. So if this is the causal hypothesis in the classical world, how would we translate it to the quantum world? Where first of all, in the quantum world, we don't really use direct tetracycline graphs, right? We use circuits. Mm -hmm. So let's draw a circuit for that. And now what do we have here? We have a common cause of X and Y. So let's say that this common cause is a quantum system. So this is some quantum system. And in a classical case, we would just send it to Alice and Bob. Now in the quantum world, we cannot do that, right? If we have a single quantum system, sorry. <laughs> okay, if we have a single quantum system, we cannot just copy it and send it to Alice and Bob. So this is the first difference that we have here between classical and quantum is that we need to introduce some kind of decomposition operation. For example, the one introduced here that will take our quantum system, decompose it, and send some part of it to Alice and some part of it to Bob. Okay, then what we want to have at the end is something similar to what we have here. So a probability distribution over classical variables. So we can allow Alice and Bob uh, to make measurements on their systems and then um, they will have classical outcomes. Okay. Okay, so what would be the analog of this case here? When on top of that, we have a causal influence, uh, influence sorry, from X to Y. So from Bob to Alice in this case. So we have a quantum system. We decompose it somehow. We send it to Alice and Bob. But now Bob needs to be in the causal past of Alice. He needs to make the measurement, get the classical outcome, send it to Alice. And then Alice's outcome will depend on uh, the outcome of Bob's measurement as well. So this part of the circuit indicates this arrow here. So while in this case, what we had at the end was the probability distribution over A and B, here we would have a probability distribution of A given B. And let's say that we have these two circuits and we want to answer, uh, and like given some correlation, we want to answer the question, which one was the underlying circuit in our process. And in order to uh, 
answer this question, let me also paraphrase the problem of the distribution generation to the quantum case. So still suppose that we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they're generating this uh, pre-specified joint probability distribution. But now the question is, what is the minimum dimension of the quantum state that they need to share such that they can generate this probability distribution? Okay, so in the classical case, you're asking about uh, the minimum number of bits that uh, need to be sent to Alice and Bob. And now we're just asking about the minimum dimension of this quantum state uh, such that Alice and Bob can generate a given probability distribution. Um, sorry, can I ask, wait, so, so this, this particular problem, so do you, do you have those two scenarios as possibilities or you, you have just the first one? Like that you have some global states to which you do local measurements. Let's say oh. or you have some splitting of your initial state. So you have both, like I'm um, yeah. By both you mean this one and this one? Yeah, yeah. So it's like let's say that you have a probability distribution, and the question that you're asking is what was the underlying circuit? This one or this one? Sure, sure. And you can also ask the question, okay, what is the minimal yeah. dimension of the state in each of the cases. Yeah, so I guess it will make sense later, but in the classical case, we had a question, what is the underlying causal structure? This one mm -hmm. and this one. And in yeah. order to answer this question, we used the corollary that uh, talked about like the minimum number of bits or like the minimum cardinality of the common cause. And all, yeah. all the corollary only applied in this case, this is why when it is violated in this case, we could conclude that there is a causal influence from X to Y. So now we're trying to do something similar. So to okay, decide- Okay, I understand. And, but just formally in the second scenario, I'm sort of a bit confused. So uh, you, um, how to put it? Uh, like, do you, do you do some, let's say Bob, uh, does Bob do some instruments? There are some general instruments, so not only he measures, but also kind of does something to his part of a state and then uh, sends something to some general entangling channel between Alice and like, yeah, how, yeah, so it could so be. I guess what I'm asking is like, uh, what are the, uh, what do you assume about MB and UAB and like, yeah. Nothing really. So uh, I don't really consider like any specific scenario. And like the only thing is that we allow communication between Bob and Alice and that this communication is classical. So like, of it's course, classical, not quantum. Yeah, this is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't say. But like here, like quantum uh, double wires ah, correspond sure. okay, to sorry. quantum yeah, variables. I, that. I see. Right. So oh, UIB no, is only no, on no, A, no. A, but depends on B. Uh, yeah. Correct. So this okay. is like an index, yes. I but see, like, so in other words, you, uh, okay, so th then since Bob communicates only classically to this upper box, then like he doesn't care about, like you, he doesn't use his like post measurement state or anything like that. He doesn't, but like still, like this could be an entangled state and like- Sure, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. So like it's still kind of matters what he does like to his state, but yeah, he yeah. only communicates the classical part, yeah. Gotcha, thanks. Um, okay, and in order to answer this question, let me introduce one last definition, which is a PSD rank. So in the classical case, we had a non-negative rank. Here we have a, a positive semi-definite rank and it's defined as follows. So this is the minimum number R such that we can decompose our non-negative matrix like this. So here, small a and b correspond to, mm, so, Big A and B are just like the indices over the whole system. And then this is small a in big A and small b in big B. And we want each element of this probability distribution uh, to be decomposed like this, where this E and F are mm, positive semi-definite matrices of this dimension. Uh, okay, so this is slightly more complicated definition and a less intuitive result, but still using this definition, we can show that um, and like it was shown that uh, for this case, when there is no communication between Alice and Bob, this must be satisfied. So the PSD rank of the probability distribution that they generate 
must be smaller or equal to D, where D is the dimension of row A and B. So this is the dimension of this system. So this needs to be D times D. And yeah, just to be clear, it's not something that we derived, it's just something that we connected to this causal problem. But again, it was studied in the communication uh, theory, like along this problem of uh, generating a probability distribution just in a quantum case. Mm, okay, so, well, as you can see, it's like this uh, result kind of connects to our classical result, right? There we had a non-negative rank, here we have a PSD rank. Still, we look at the classical probability distribution. And in the classical case, here we had a cardinality, and now we have a dimension of a quantum state. But still, I didn't show you a corollary that would say something about like the separation and how can I read it off just from looking at the circuit. And this is why, because it's like more complicated than in the classical case. So in the quantum formalism, when we have circuits, we don't really have things like conditional independence and the separations and all of this stuff. So although you can see that there is some correspondence between the classical case and the quantum case, it's impossible to directly translate classical results, the classical corollary to the quantum one. So I guess the main result here is that we can use our classical intuitions to study the quantum world, but sometimes it's just impossible to make a direct uh, translation of a theorem that holds in a classical case to the quantum case. Okay. Um, and one last thing that I wanted to say is what happens if we reverse the question? So now we ask how to learn something about causal inference using the quantum formalism, because it's also possible. So in quantum theory, we study a lot of bell type inequalities, right? Uh, and it's a question that, well, people know very well, and it's a pretty old question, I would say. And uh, for example, the entropic, uh, and like information theoretic entropic inequality constraints that uh, we derived, this whole methodology was actually inspired by quantum foundations. So first, the entropic version of the Bell inequality appeared in the quantum foundations uh, community. And then uh, it was that the causal inference people adapted the, uh, it to study classical causal models. So I think that this was the first paper that discusses and. Yeah, it was entropic inequalities for non-contextuality non and locality. And then we had papers like this one, uh, which is inferring latent structures via information inequalities. So I just wanted to show this as a, an example that we can not only uh, learn about uh, quantum causality, like so-called quantum causality, uh, by studying classical causal models, but also because Bell inequality is such, an, like Bell type inequalities are such a big topic in the quantum formalism. There are a lot of methods that were actually taken from the quantum world and then people apply them in classical causal inference and made a lot of progress in the field. So it's also a possibility. Okay, and that's all that I wanted to talk to you about today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beata, for a nice talk. Uh, yeah, we have time for questions, comments to the speaker. Yeah. Maybe I could ask something. Please. So, can you could you go back to this uh, definition of uh, positive semi-definite rank? Or yeah. Okay. So, can you recover the non-negative rank of the of the of the other matrix, this non-negative p x y matrix here? I mean, from this definition, can you get the other one? Yes, you can. I don't think it's straightforward, but you can. And how? That's a good question. Like, I remember that it's possible, but now there are... <laughs> okay, so... Maybe commuting matrices or something like this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Because <laughs> we take the trace here, but like here we have... Hmm. And this, this E and F matrices, do they form a measurement? Yeah, I mean, they're just like positive semi definite matrices, right? And no. there's like no. Do they sum up to, to the identity? They don't have to. Okay. Maybe they can. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't remember. Like, I remember that it's possible, but it, that it was not straightforward. 
but I don't think that it follows from the definition that they must form. Right? But they shouldn't sum to, to the identity, no? Because, uh, I don't know, so. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure, sorry, but I don't, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, I guess it doesn't really sort of matter if people are not so, let's say, accustomed to any matrix ranks, but the problem starts if you work with some matrix ranks that are other than those ones half of your life and then you're struck with this new notion that is a bit yes, exactly. <laughs> well i just wanted to see because in the other definition you have a sum of this uh, like products let's say no i mean like vectors with the transpositions and here you have just traced so there is not a composition in some sense okay i mean it's not yeah. like so i just wanted to see how like you go from this expression to the sum that you have in the other definition there is also because there is a like a few different equivalent definitions of a non-negative rank, and I just presented this one because it corresponds nicely to having a probability distribution that we decompose. But I think that like going from this expression to non-negative rank, uh, a different definition would be useful. But yeah, as I said, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly how it goes, okay. but it's possible. So, okay, can I ask, because um, you focused on, let's say, causality in, let's say, causal explanations for, uh, for probability distributions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do people study, uh, let's say, stochastic uh, probabilistic processes and how they can sort of, I mean, there, there might be some dependencies you know when you have some dynamics you might have some part some parts of the system that affects the the other parts of the system but you you have uh, you know you have stochastic maps maybe not random variables uh, so was there some work on the causa on the classical side of this what do you mean by having like stochastic maps instead of variables because you could well, have well, like... I, I mean, like, okay, so imagine, okay, so this is something that, for instance, we feel we play a lot when, oh, and Yannick and uh, Oscar, like when we sort of try to model uh, like noise in actual quantum devices, right? So no. what what happens, okay, I, I know it's like maybe a bit far-fetched, but like what, what, okay, like you can say that globally, okay, it's some stochastic, global stochastic map that affects or your, let's say, that acts globally. But then in practice, you start to see some look, some that, you know, some influences between some parts of the system on that you have some locality there, first of all, and second, that some parts of the system, let's say, inf uh, influence the other, like, so for example, input, like what happens so some random variable when you uh, add with noise on it that depends what was the input in the other part of the system right uh, this is what we observe right uh, and just uh, yeah yeah Maybe. so like in general people like definitely a common cause of this sort can be considered as a random noise or like noise that influences variables in the system, right? So you can definitely model this sort of it, things in classical uh, causal inference. Now, when it comes uh, to the quantum stuff, so if you actually want to have, a, for example, like classical noise that influences quantum variables, I don't think that people model it with causal models, but um, like I would just say that you could, like you can really model a lot of things with common causes so for example right now i'm working on a project where like people have let's say a map that uh, also have leakage to the environment so people usually say that you have a quantum map but there's like also environment and because the map is noisy then can be some like some information can leak to the environment so this is something that can be easily modeled with a quantum common cause so like an environment could be let's say a different party that shares a common cause with you. And then instead of saying that there is a leakage of information, you just say that because they share this common cause that you can interpret as an environment, this environment somehow transfers uh, the information 
between the map and like the other party that you interpret as having access to this environment. So yeah, I don't know if, if this answers your question, but in general, like to model noisy stuff, you can, I guess, use common causes for that. Thanks. Uh, other questions to Vata? Uh, yes, uh, can you go to the last inequality in your presentation? This one? Yes, uh, so uh, so the result here is that uh, uh, if the, uh, this is the causal structure, then this inequality is fulfilled. Uh, yes. This is the result, right? Yeah. And uh, what about the other causal structure? Like, I mean, uh, yeah, so that's the question. Yeah. Uh... So there's like no inequality for the other causal structure. So the only thing that you can conclude is that if you're trying to, sorry, if you're trying to decide between these two causal structures, then you can test this inequality. And if it's violated, then you can conclude that the other causal structure is correct. Right, if those were two options, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. of course. But this is also like if it's not violated, it could be the case that both, like mm -hmm. either the first one or the second one, uh, are correct. But like usually in causal inference, when you ask whether there exists a direct causal influence, and you can show that it's not necessary for it to exist, then you can say that you can model your model uh, between uh, like without using this direct causal influence. Cool, thanks. Okay, uh, so last chance to ask something more to Vata. Okay, I'll take a chance. Okay, uh, mm. so in this, let's say, yeah, in uh, like, what's your take what, what, in this field of the same in, uh, interface between uh, causality and quantum mechanics? What is let's say the biggest open problem and biggest challenge that sort of? Uh, I think it depends who you ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but your personal opinion, you know. <laughs> so I would personally love to see uh, like quantum formalism that is maybe not a quantum generalization, but like has as clear rules as classical causal inference has, mm, mm -hmm. but for quantum systems and like well, to be able to de separation, e separation and yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. That would be like, I don't like, it's not possible for it to be like exact analogs of de separation and e separation, but like, I would personally love to see something like this. But on the other hand, like for people who work with this, like, uh, indefinite causal structures and like superpositions of causal structures then like the problem becomes much more complicated right because you also allow for like superpositions of them and uh phenomena that are just like what very have you ever observed such <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so like i personally uh, like this view a lot and like uh yeah, I had a list of generalizations from classical to quantum stuff. And like, there are a lot of things that we can generalize to the quantum formalism, but there is definitely something missing there. And like, there's definitely a big gap between what we can say about the causality in the quantum world and uh, in the classical world. So, yeah. Right. I wonder uh, what's your take on it. Like if anybody <laughs> the end, has any... My, well, my maybe it's just how it is, you know. Reality no, is I, very weird. Maybe. Yeah. I don't like. Yeah. First, I don't have. I I don't work in that, so I don't think I'm sort of <laughs> sort of much. I mean, like the topic is very interesting, but I sort of yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't feel qualified to give an answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. But okay. Maybe. After a second thought, uh, yeah, I, I guess what is what can be missing, like, I mean, I, I tend to align maybe with, with what, what you are saying, but what what I guess tends, tends to be missing is some kind of understanding of like influences that, you know, when you have some complicated circuits or complicated quantum processes, when you have 
I don't know, maps arranged in some way, like some interventions there, uh, like, like, okay, like actually understanding what, uh, kind of what causes what and how this like information is spreading in this com complex setting, let's say, I don't know how, <laughs> okay, but it's very general <laughs> what I'm saying. So I guess I tend to agree with you, but yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, there are some works that go in this direction also like, between uh, like distinguishing between inferences and influences, like even quantum circuits. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think we're very far from having like a full theory of quantum causality and we're so far from it that it's like impossible to say which direction is a good direction. Right, you mentioned inferences and influ influences. So uh, influences, I, I tend to understand intuitively at least what it means, but what inferences, mean in this context like yeah so it's yeah. in here for example if you observe a correlation between x and y here it could be due to influence because it's a direct influence yeah but here it could be like inference through a common cause ah in that sense so okay, okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right uh so correlation versus causation yeah, yeah that... also <laughs> yeah, yeah okay uh okay I guess with this we can uh, conclude. To, to bet you could, okay, like due to this pandemic circumstances, it was a, it, like half of the people actually are uh, at their homes at the moment, so it will be very effective. But hopefully soon this, I mean, this year we can meet in person, maybe in Gdansk or in, in Warsaw. We are always yeah, or in Warsaw. Like, like when we were starting planning the seminar, I was supposed to go to Warsaw, right? But then all that is correct. Yeah. This then Omicron well. came. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. OK. Thanks, Bata, again. And uh, yeah, uh, let's OK. Let's thank the speaker again for a nice talk and uh, discussion. And thank you. We'll meet next week, the same, same time. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. bye.